So I am Dr. Wes King, and I am delighted to be here to talk with you all today about Jesus and gender. And hopefully I can stop sharing the Jello screen and share the slides for you all. There we have it. So I am a, a scholar of gender and religion and technology. And in my early research, understanding really kind of what gender is all about in seminary, I decided to explore the Gospel of John and to study uh, the kind of the gender, societal gender notions in the time of Jesus. And this discussion, I like to call community over conformity. And the reason that I looked at the Gospel of John was because I wanted to understand how Jesus may have interacted with gender roles at his time and how that might help us imagine how we could interact with what is increasingly uh, changing uh, notions of gender in our time and so many um, conversations and the previous culture wars over lesbian and gay marriage, and now what used to be called the gay agenda is now the trans agenda. And it's, I think understanding gender is a huge part of both of these conversations that are happening in the church. And so one of the questions that I have is, you know, how do we determine whether societal gender construct is in alignment with the commonwealth of God or whether it's an opposition? And, you know, what is it about gender that will help us to establish godly community on here, um, here on earth as it is in heaven? And then finally, one of my big questions, because um, I love speculative fiction, I love science fiction, and I love thinking about the kingdom to come, what will gender be like, or what will it be for in the ages to come? And so before we get into uh, looking at a passage in the Gospel of John and thinking about gender, I'd like to have us um, kind of go off into some breakout rooms and talk about what you already know about gender. Like, what is gender? So, if you could send people off, Carrie. Are there any questions before we go out to breakouts? Okay, here we go. Gender ideas then and now, and kind of uh, bring these into conversation with one another. So, you know, we have this notion of, of gender uh, as we've understood it as uh, socially constructed and, um, you know, as someone else said that it is not sex, uh, it is not the same as sex. However, um, there are some histories related to our understanding of gender and sex and for some time, I remember, you know, there were some forms that I would fill out where it would ask me to identify my sex. And then there were other forms that would ask me to identify my gender. And there were beliefs that your sex determines your gender. And I grew up with some of these ideas and maybe you did too. Maybe you heard that, you know, if you had, you know, were assigned a sex of male that you were a man and that was your, your gender. And so I just wanted to explore some of these ideas a little bit further. And I have a lovely list here now of some of the ways that we might think about sex and gender. Um, because they are very much related. And although we may consider a person's sex as 
male or female, a biological fact uh, that varies little across time and cultures, you know, what that sex means in terms of gender roles, gender identity, gender expression, all of those things, um, it does differ and it differs quite significantly, not just across cultures, but across time. And when we think about gender roles, uh, some look to the Bible to help define, you know, to separate and to differentiate women from men. And they will find expressions of differentiation as the Bible describes the cultural gender constructs that were prevalent in the times in which it was written. And others find the Bible is leading us towards a unified humanity, a community of cooperative friends who are more alike than different, regardless of our gender identity. And so I just wanted to go through some of these terms and kind of how they interact with our ideas about gender and, um, and we'll get into this uh, just kind of broad discussion about gender before we look at a specific passage in the Gospel of John. So this idea of uh, being created by God, and there are so many, um, you know, gender ideologies within Christianity that, you know, may or may not interpret gender as something that happened at the creation of Adam and Eve. However, many do think of Adam as a man and Eve as a woman, and that these are both sex and gender, and that these this differentiation of humans into Adam and Eve, a man and a woman, is intended for reproduction. And they often, you know, like locate this idea in, you know, the command to be fruitful and multiply. So it's intended for reproduction. And this relates to kind of our modern day concept of biological sex, you know, the body parts, the genitals, you know, maybe your genetics, right? Like we talk about the X and the Y chromosome. And this knowledge is, you know, produced within our medical communities, right? Like we didn't always have this knowledge, right? We didn't know what genes were back when Adam and Eve were created, right? Like we can't go and, and karyotype Adam and Eve. You know, that's just not gonna happen. Um, and then, you know, as a result of all these, you know, medicalized knowledges, and then also the forms that come along with, you know, keeping track of people in society, you know, we get, we get this idea of gender assigned at birth. And gender assigned at birth is really kind of a result of the separation of sex and gender, right? So as a result of a lot of, you know, feminist work that was done to, you know, kind of disturb uh, the oppressive gender ideologies that existed, uh, that caused and limited them and, and were very oppressive, right? They sought liberation from these oppressions and tried to disentangle this notion of, your biological sex determining your gender roles, determining your gender abilities, um, all of those kinds of things. So uh, I think it would be really interesting to, to think about how these histories, right, impact how we think about gender today. And so we have, you know, gender assigned at birth, and then now we have this concept of our gender identity being you know, potentially different than our gender expression. And then we have this notion, uh, I think that one of you mentioned, this idea of a perceived gender, and that's how others see us, which is dependent upon, right, our understanding of what we know about gender, right, is, is you know, this kind of way of dressing mean, you know, does it mean that you are this particular gender, right? And so these, these social constructs of gender are what help us to, you know, interact with these ideas and understand each other. And it also, you know, we put each other into categories and we, you know, say that you are, you know, maybe you're not like me because you are like this. 
Um, and maybe you are like me because you are like this. And so um, these social constructs of, ge of gender, they do work, right? They help us to imagine things, to think about things and to recognize things. And then another thing is the biopolitical category. I mean, you all have probably heard of identity politics and you know the cultural wars of you know the gay agenda and now the trans agenda um but you know previously like identity politics and a lot of uh the work that is done is is because of this notion of like how how we categorize and classify people has real world effects um and for some it limits their life choices and their life options and their uh, you know ability to flourish and then there's uh, one of my favorite categories, which is an erotic self or an erotic other. And so often we just locate, you know, these uh, sex and gender and, and, and our relationships with sex and gender, right? Because when we think about having an intimate and an erotic relationship, we are often thinking about ourselves as a particular gender in relationship to another as a particular you know sex or gender and then when we have an erotic experience we may have arousal we may have attraction there's a number of things that go on and this is you know part of the pleasure of of sex and gender that we think about and uh, you know so for people who are trans gender right they may have an experience of gender euphoria and that's a pleasure of like being able to recognize themselves as a gender that they internally feel that may not be recognized by others. And so, um, so these are just some of the, you know, some of the big ideas about gender that um, I want us to kind of keep in mind and think about how these ideas come to be, right? Like the story of Adam and Eve, right? And, and why gender and sex even exist right? Why is it part of the human experience? What did God intend? Like, these are things that we ask and things that we think about. Um, and then what is, what is the hope for the future, right? Um, I think that there's a lot of things that we can imagine and that we can, um, we can think about in regards to gender that we can definitely interact with some of our historical texts in the Bible that help us to think well. So we're gonna do another little breakout. And uh, I just want you all to take a few minutes to, to think about like, how do you know what is true uh, about gender and identities? Um, so for, you know, for example, how do you know someone is a man or a woman? Or how do you know whether you are a man or a woman? Um, how do you know who you're attracted to? How do you know whether that person you're attracted to is a man or a woman? And so those are the things that I'd like you to think about. Like, how do you know these things in your next breakout section? I'm going to stop sharing for a moment. So uh, many times we do depend upon the Bible to know the things that we know about what it means to be human, what it means to be gendered in the world today. and uh, even from the earliest images from Sunday school, which uh, we have here the, an image from the woman at the well. And that's the story in John that I'd like us to, um, to listen to here. And if Darren would be willing to read this out loud for us, we'll just briefly look at the story. Sure. A Samaritan woman came to the, to, to the well to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me some water to drink. His disciples had gone into the city to buy him some food. The Samaritan woman asked, why, did you, why do you, a Jewish man, ask for something to drink from me, a Samaritan woman? Jews and Samaritans didn't associate with each other. Jesus responded, if you recognize God's gift and who is saying to you, give me some water to drink, you would be asking him and he would give you living water. The woman said to him, sir, you don't have a bucket and the well is deep. Where would you get this living water? You aren't, you aren't greater than our father Jacob, are you? 
he gave us, he gave this well to us and he drank from, he drank from it himself as did his sons and his livestock. Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks from the water that I will give will never be thirsty again. The water that I give will become in those who drink it, a spring of water that bubbles up into eternal life. The woman said to him, sir, give me this water so that I will never be thirsty and will never need to come here to draw, to draw water. Jesus said to her, go get your husband and come back here. The woman replied, I don't have a husband. You are right to say, I don't have a husband, Jesus answered. You've had five husbands and the man you are and the man you are with now isn't your husband. You've spoken the truth. The woman said, sir, I see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshiped on this mountain, but you and your people say that it is necessary to worship in Jerusalem. Jesus said to her, believe me, woman, the time is coming when you and your people will worship the father, neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You and your people worship what you don't know. We worship what we know because salvation is from the Jews. But the time is coming and is here when true worshipers will worship in spirit and in and truth. The Father looks for those who will worship him this way. God is spirit and it is necessary to worship God in spirit and truth. The woman said, I know that the Messiah is coming, the one who is called the Christ. When he comes, he will, teach a, he will teach everything to us. Jesus said to her, I am the one who speaks with you. Thank you so much. So I want you to just think about what you hear in this story about Jesus and, and gender. And you can maybe talk about it in the next breakout session, but I just want you to think about it for a minute and think about maybe the different social roles that came up in this particular story, um, maybe some of the cultural norms. Um, and so uh, just keep those in mind as we go on into the next session. So um, this story for me, um, out of all of the stories in uh, the Gospel of John, is, is one of the examples that I think really combines a lot of different ideas of what was going on in the culture at the time and our understanding of the social norms for what it means to be a man or a woman in society in Jesus' time. Uh, there are other you know, passages in, in the Gospel of John that are very interesting, but in this story, uh, Jesus not only went against the social norm that men do not speak to unrelated women in public, there was this division of uh, public space was for men and private spaces were for women. This was, uh, you know, some, some ideas that were going on in understanding gender and uh, both the Greek and Roman societies at the time. Um, and so he crossed boundaries of cultural norms as well that Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Um, and if any of you all are familiar with uh, this idea, the Samaritans were considered mixed breeds to some degree. Um, I don't really like that term, uh, but it's a, a quick and shorthand way of talking about uh, the ways that, you know, the Jews really de depended so much on their lineage, on their purity, and the Samaritans, you know, were descendants, many of them, of many Jews, but they were only partially. They were only like half Jew. And as Jesus brings up the question of her position in society by asking about her husband, um, he highlights that in some sense, this woman could have been considered a slave. Uh, according to traditional gender roles of the day, she had no place in society apart from being married, unless she was a rich and privileged woman. Um, the societal gender constructs and her dependent position forced her to continue to enslave herself to men, one after another, for survival purposes. But Jesus treated the Samaritan woman as one who was worthy of hearing the good news of life offered through him. And the radical nature of Jesus' message 
prompted her to overcome the social gender norms. And she transgressed and went into the public realm and announced the good news of Jesus, the Messiah. So we see so many boundaries transgressed. Um, we see the boundaries of you know, Judea and Samaria, the, there was a, you know, kind of a tradition of avoiding Samaria. So you'll see the blue routes on that map there, where the religious people and those who were concerned about holding up purity standards, they would travel around Samaria. And Jesus specifically chose to go through. And so he transgressed the, the spatial boundaries, the cultural boundaries, the historical boundaries that they were not supposed to associate with these people. And then he transgressed the man-woman boundaries of relational and intimate, not supposed to speak to unrelated women. And, and of course, as I mentioned, this idea of purity um, this notion of being pure and impure is, is an ideology that was very strong at the time. And so for him to be speaking to this woman um, was, was definitely, uh, you know, kind of looked down upon as she was considered impure uh, and he was considered pure as a Jew, which then, you know, created this positional us versus them kind of of space that they were in um in other narratives in john you know jesus resists oppressive social structures regarding family obligations uh that were taking him away from building community with his father with his followers and uh however he takes those obligations up again when he entrusts the care of his mother to John at the end of the gospel. And I, I thought this was really interesting in relationship to the family obligations and that in one point in this gospel, he, he resisted those norms. And then in another point, he took them up. And so there must be something bigger at work here than whether to do the right thing according to your gender or not. And, and this is where I kind of come to this idea of community over conformity. And that for Jesus, it was about bringing people together and not about separating them. And so my last provocative question that I would like you all to consider before I, uh, I wrap up our discussion tonight is, does Jesus have a gender? I've been referring to Jesus as him. The biblical text has done that for a very long time. And, uh, you know, and we have this notion of Jesus being a man. Um, and so I would just like you all to take a few minutes and discuss uh, whether Jesus has a gender and in what way do you think and, and what makes you believe that Jesus has a gender? Keep going. So is gender something that we have, right? Like, does it belong to us? Is it something we possess? Is it a, is it a thing that is a stable part of our identity? Like, these are big questions about what it means to be a human in all of creation, right? Well, here we are in this world. And, uh, and there's so much, you know, history and, and change in our world today, especially. Um, however, I want to share with you, like, one of the earliest icons of Jesus that um, has been found. And it is um, this beautiful image where, you know, you see Jesus, you know, today we might interpret this as, you know, kind of a feminine uh, looking Jesus, definitely, you know, um, not the, the, uh, uh, what, what did I, I, I was mentioning earlier, you know, the, uh, the muscle, the muscle Jesus. Um, and, and yet there's another early icon of Jesus 
you know, and, and to me, this one, you know, carries a lot more like masculine feeling to it. And, and so I'm like, oh my gosh, like there are different ways to see Jesus and, and like, and the art, you know, as well as the Bible, like we have all of these different sources of information. Like now we know a little bit about like the culture at the time of Jesus and what the gender roles and expectations were. And, you know, so did he fit? Did he not fit? Was he like gender? Like we have these words now, was he like gender fluid? You know, like if he's, if he's all God and all Jesus and God doesn't have a gender, does Jesus have a gender? You know, like, how do we, how do we imagine these things? And um, one of my favorite philosophers, a feminist philosopher, Linda Alcoff, said that identities are best understood as ways in which we and others around us represent our material ties to historical events and social structures. So there's a materiality to it. There's, there's an embodiment, like it, this, this sense of identity, it happens in our body. And, you know, sometimes it's visible, sometimes it's not, sometimes it's legible, right? Like the society can interpret and understand it. You know, like the first icon of Jesus might be interpreted in one way differently than the second icon of Jesus that I showed you. And those are some of the earliest icons. Um, and so I think it's really important for us to keep all of these things in mind, our bodies, our, our society and our histories. However, there's also a future and we have a hope in Christ and in, in the coming of, of this new heaven and new earth, where as Paul imagines, there is no longer Jew or Greek. So all of those cultural differences, there is no longer slave or free as those kind of positional differences. And there's no longer male and female for all of you are one in Christ Jesus. And so the two icons that I showed you are really just one icon. And when you split it in half and fold it over, it presents each of those two icons that I shared with you. And so we see, you know, we, we hear about like Jesus as the lion and the lamb. And, you know, we mix all of these things up. But what do we do when we start thinking that, well, there's gender fluid now, or there's non-binary, and you know, where would Jesus fit in these terms? Can we put any of these terms on Jesus? Um, you know, I've heard arguments that you know, well, Jesus, you know, had to be intersex because you know there was no sperm involved in his birth or whatever. And, you know, and, and these are just things we can't know, right? We cannot karyotype Jesus. But what we can know are some of these like cultural ideas and what we know now about gender that we didn't know then. Um, and also what we can imagine in the future to me is a very important thing for us to consider. In Isaiah 65, we read, I will create new heavens and a new earth. The former things will not be remembered, nor will they come to mind. But be glad and rejoice forever in what I will create. For I will create Jerusalem to be a delight and its people a joy. I will rejoice over Jerusalem and take delight in my people. The sound of weeping and of crying will be heard in it no more. And I think of so many people who are L G B T Q I A all of all of the alphabets that are in the alphabet soup or part of the TikTok alphabet mafia right we're taking over the alphabet uh, it's happening uh, I, I prefer to use the term gender sexual and relationship diversities personally but you know GSRD is not as recognized yet um, but there is a future and what will that future look like. Um, uh, so I have this lovely image for you, you know, like in, uh, in, uh, in America, at least, you know, we, we've, we're going for the artificial intelligence and robots and cyborgs. And, you know, I, I won't even tell you, but I am going to be teaching a class on AI and religion. Um, and, you know, so like, uh, there's a, there's a robot priest in, in Japan. It's, it's, it's fabulous. Right. Is that what our future is? You know, these androgynous, you know, 
robotic or cyborgs, right? Is this what's going to, you know, connect us to eternity or to the heavens, the new heavens and the new earth? Um, this is from, you know, an, an artistic rendering based upon images in Ezekiel. And, you know, like we have no idea what was actually seen, especially if it was something that hadn't yet been created. How can you describe something that you do not know? Um, what historical beliefs inform our beliefs about the future? And so for me, I like the idea of gender expansive identities and I'm wearing my shirt that says gender is a galaxy. So I just want to leave you on this image and this idea of gender being a galaxy. And it's something we get to explore together and to go into the future together, imagining the beauty and the diversity of God's creation that we have yet to know, that we have yet to know. And may we know God through knowing one another and being in community together. And that is my hope. Thank you.